Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Tonight, we are celebrating powerful women pushing the boundaries of their artistic mediums. She Bends, a network of women who are bending their own neon art, presents Of Luminance, a film by She Bends artist and filmmaker Jess Cruchel. The film is an inspiring piece on women in neon, challenging narratives, and celebrating the craft of neon glass blowing and the future of this unconventional material. After the film, please stay with us and meet some of the artists live from She Bends to hear more about their practice and upcoming projects. Please give a warm welcome to She Bends. Working with glass and neon has taught me patience. It is a tricky material to work with. It takes a lot of time to build up enough skill to, to have something made, something that lasts. And then all of that can disappear in a moment. I think it's taught me patience. Uh, it's taught me a lot about failure and uh, it's taught me how to be okay from failure, how to grow through failure and how much failure is an essential part of being human but also being an artist. I'm much more about form and materiality and Bringing subtlety to neon. Kind of finding meaning in the making. Uh, neon is always the loudest thing in any room at any time. And sometimes I'm really interested in kind of taking that away from the material so it becomes something else and it kind of transcends the traditional parameters of what we're used to seeing the material do. You can kind of see it here with the different temperature of the light. So you've got the cool and you've got the warm. Um, and then this, it makes this, this surface here incredibly sculptural. When there's more people doing something or working in the same field, then it becomes a lot riper for developments, whether it's technology, whether it is artistic um, dialogue within the material. Yeah, I got turned down for my residency once because someone on the board said, you know, neon's not art. So we really liked your stuff, everything was great. I got like shortlisted, I was like, oh, it's now my job to make other people <laughs> understand that or just to open the door a little bit wider you know it's like people will get things at their own rates whenever I'm talking to anyone about it they go oh you do neon that's so weird I'm like oh it's just way fun and they're like really and I'm like yeah you just stand over the fire and you bend shapes and it's just it's addictive it's, it's got a hook and it's just an unreasonable amount of fun I think everyone should do it at least once and, and then there's some people that are like this is not what I expected and it's actually really really hard and I'm like yeah it is it is hard you know it is hard but it's just muscle memory and it's just knowing what to look for So I think there's like a lot of like psychohistorical aspects to um, to the draw of neon that uh, are built in, and uh, I just think that there hasn't been a an explosion in the art world the way there have been in other mediums, and I feel like neon is very rarely invited into that world.
I see myself reflected in the roses because in my head I'm I'm like a rose you know I'm, I'm I'm part of nature I'm beautiful I have my petals When I'm working with it in the fire, it's just so... See that movement, that, that change of state? It taught me how to appreciate those small moments of, like the flow of, of the glass. I don't want to compare mediums, but... But it's just so different from from you know sculptures it's just different and I like it I like it because it's different I like it because it it just attracts you to see it I absolutely love film and I was from a small town and I didn't have a lot of neon exposure outside of, you know, the, the beer sign you would see at, you know, the little Chick's Tavern in the middle of town. And I just remember being exposed to neon through all these different films. And it was actually Hitchcock's Vertigo. There's a scene where Kim Novak comes out of the darkness down this hallway and she passes over this window that has this very large bright green neon sign shining in and the first time you really get a glimpse of her is when she's just bathed in this green neon light and I remember just thinking I want to do that like I want to be surrounded by that light and I went into this neon studio in Brooklyn and had the best time I think I even stayed late like hours after the class ended and the owner of the neon studio noticed that I had brought in my own pattern. I knew nothing about neon. I didn't know anything really about patterns, but I had been drawing it digitally for a while. And one thing I did grasp is like, you have to draw the tubes as they should be bent. And it was a very basic understanding, but it was enough for him to take notice. I try and experiment with a lot of different gases, so I'm really fascinated by like helium and xenon and some of the other rare or non-traditional gases used, where you can actually like kind of see the, the ethereal nature of the gas inside of it. There's a little bit of a gradient from the center of the tube where the light kind of hangs out to the outside of the tube where there's more, more visibility of that color. I like to experiment with the colors that it can make inside colored non-coated tubes as well as colored and coated tubes. I think that sometimes they make these sour looking colors that are really interesting and neat. And I'm basically creating my own, you know, swatches here of colors to choose from for different works that, that haven't really been maybe experimented with before. Neon artists, people who use it as an art form, are reinvigorating the trade right now. I hope and think that that will continue. Everybody, thank you for joining us um, and thank you Fran for that introduction. My name is Meryl Padicky. I am the founder of She Bends. I am an artist and an educator. I've been bending neon for about 15 years. We're here in my San Francisco studio. Um, she Bends' main mission, mission is to support women bending their own neon art and this is my partner. 
Hi, I'm Kelsey Issel. I'm the co-owner of Sheepens. We're so excited to be here today, have the opportunity to screen uh, Jess's film of Luminescence, uh, especially in the context of the De Young and the Judy Chicago retrospective. Uh, Judy was interviewed for the last virtual Wednesdays and she mentioned her challenges in the high art world working in glass. And so we feel so fortunate to be able to continue that conversation here. Jess has done such a wonderful job of showing the intimacy, uh, the meditative practice of making neon along with the scientific and technical practices and how that really pushes the conceptual growth of the neon. Um, we are also joined Sorry, you guys, we're clearly having internet issues in the <laughs> studio. <laughs> uh, we're also joined by Teresa Escobar, Kate Hush, Sarah Blood, and Casey Lees, all the way from Amsterdam. Uh, we want to kick it to Jess to introduce her film and tell us a little about the process of making it. Hi, I'm Jess. Um, so my film explores the history, the craft, and the future of neon lights told through uh, the eyes of woman identifying artists. Um, I hope that my film challenges the false dichotomy between science and art. And I hope that I can provide an honest conversation about the importance and future of any type of craft that's passed on from generation to generation. Um, it was a lot of fun to make and I'm still currently making it. So, yeah. That's great. Um, Jess, you are a biology student and a neon artist. How did these subjects start to intersect in your life? Um, I personally believe that everything is interlinked. Um, I've had a profound love for science since I was younger um, and a desire to share stories, whether that be through visual art or through filmmaking. Um, and it wasn't until I found neon when I was confronted with that reality and that everything actually intersected. And I realized that all of these love that I've had for such a long time came back to the top. And um, that's when they really started intersecting. So it was about a few years ago and I realized I can actually talk about what I wanna talk about and do what I wanna do uh, with everything that's important to me. Yeah. Um, you're knowledgeable about the films made about Neon thus far. Um, and this is kind of the first film that's made about the craft of neon from the perspective of a bender and a woman and an artist. Um, what work do you see that doing in the world? Mm, this is a good question. What work do I see that doing in the world? Um, well, I think about neon is extremely captivating to me. Neon is real life magic. And um, I spend the time a lot of time alone with it. And it wasn't until I spent that time alone when I realized that this is something that needs to be shared with other people. And not a lot of people know how to do it. A lot of people don't know how it's made. They don't respect it um, as an art form that it actually is. And so I really hope to open people's eyes and show them that it is an art. It's a very important art form um, that doesn't get a lot of attention in the art world. And I hope to change people's minds with that. Yeah. <laughs> what was uh, like one of the standout moments when you were uh, producing the film or um, in interviewing some of these artists? I, this might sound strange, but I actually really like it when I am talking with somebody or I'm watching them bend and they're kind of struggling with it, whether that's like struggling with the question I've asked or struggling bending because it just kind of humanizes the whole structure and process of making neon. Neon isn't this glamorous thing. Like a lot of people just think that it's like this bright, beautiful light, always positive. Um, and there's a lot of blood <laughs> and tears that go into making neon. And it, it takes a long time to learn how to do it. And so when I'm filming people and interviewing them, I really like to see that raw material, that, that raw emotion come through. And it really does just humanize and humble me and uh, I, I really like that part of uh, making this film. <laughs> and, you know, you mentioned that like neon is this like bright or often seen as this bright glamorous thing. And 
we have artists here today who really challenge that, who either take that away from the medium and their artwork or deal with it in some way. Um, and Casey Lee is joining us all the way from Amsterdam. Yeah, so thank you, Casey. <laughs> um, and you mentioned in the film um, that Neon often isn't given the space uh, to be in the, in the art world. So I'd love for you to, to comment on that. And we also see you naturally not working in neon, but surrounded by print screens. So we'd love to tell you to tell us about what those screens are for. Yeah, sure. It was um, actually really great that you, uh, you just wanted to film a non-neon portion of your neon video. Uh, but yeah, I was making a, a screen print and textbook about the craft of neon that I'd been researching for a year or so. Um, and I was lucky enough to have Jess come into the studio and, and grab some photos of it because all I have were just little documentation photos going all along. And it's really nice to have that kind of like glossy, uh, beautiful footage, the soft focus. Oh, it's really nice. Um, but that is um, the book that I wanted to find in the store that wasn't there. That's the book I wanted to read about Neon and there's just not that many out there. So uh, I put together all of these lessons from classes I've taught. Uh, you find yourself kind of saying the same <laughs> four or five things over and over again, or I found myself making all these one sheets to simplify the process. Uh, to turn to turn the practice into illustrations so that people could access it from a lot of different angles. And uh, this was kind of what, what came out of it. Um, yeah, it's great. It's in its, it's getting in its second edition any minute now. <laughs> uh, I wanna jump in and ask you a question that wasn't exactly on our script, but you, what kind of inks did you print with and how are they significant to translating the process of neon? Yeah, so it was all um, either black or fluorescent ink. Um, so something about the way the fluorescent ink picks up more of the UV spectrum uh, than regular ink does. It, regular ink just reflects it. So um, fluorescent ink grabs more of the UV and reflects it back to you. So it's just more active. You know, it spoke more to the language of light. It just made a lot more sense as far as like the design. Um, and uh, I didn't, I don't, oh, I, I don't think I used any glow in the dark, but uh, you know, maybe the next project, I guess. Uh, I find it very interesting that you chose to hand make each, each edition of that book, each book yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I won't do it again. I mean, I don't think, I don't think I will, uh, but I did it once and I would, like if I could go back, I would do it again the first time, but I just, I don't need to do it a second time. Um, but it's something about kind of embedding that, um, that handmade touch into it. And so much about neon is like encapsulating motion and like freezing time, right? Like you bend a tube and then the bend that you made in a few seconds is solid, right? It's there forever now. Um, so something about the screen printing process too ends up being kind of these marks of creation, these like frozen moments in time. And to me that that just made sense from the beginning. And it was really wonderful to kind of have it come together that way. And now when people see that book, they they can, you know, feel the labor that went into it, right? Like the free labor <laughs> that went into that. Um, but that's that's part of making art objects or making um, kind of utilitarian objects. And I feel like my work kind of lives in the blur between utilitarian and art objects. Um, so uh, just kind of expanding that, that network of like limited series works to that really kind of like address the, the process of neon in a constellatory kind of way, right? So it's, it's all around. Um, yeah, I should get back in the bending studio soon. <laughs> um, well, speaking of bending, you also mentioned something very interesting in the film, which is that Neon kind of has embedded in it this uh, psycho-historical aspects. Uh, can you speak to what you're referring to when you say that in the film? 
Yeah, sure. This is something I look into in my practice a lot, which is um, kind of what are these inherent qualities in neon um, and why do we think this already and uh, what has happened uh, historically to, to build the, the perception that we have of neon now. Um, and that would be different from uh, an American or someone else, right? Because um, because of how this medium has kind of traveled the world in different pockets. Uh, but yeah, I think it's really important to address the history of the item or the object or the materials that you're working in. Uh, and to know that we assume it's an advertising medium just because it, that's how it's presented to us most often. Um, and I have no interest in that side of it. <laughs> um, I kind of want to address it, right? Say, hello, yes, it is a advertising medium. That's nice. And just put it over there and do other stuff now. We can move on. We can do other stuff now. We don't have to sell third party things. We can just explore what's going on in that tactile universe of touching light and making form and kind of just taking it from also this line drawing you know people think it is a line it is like it's never a line it's a line in a photograph I guess but like when you're looking at it it's dimensional um, and there's a lot going on and I think that that materiality alone has so much to explore inside of it um, and that's like kind of the groundwork for, for any of the classes I teach. Um, you know, I like to think like, what's the assumed culture that Neon has already embedded in it? And like, how do we kind of dig our way out of that? Absolutely. It's so important to do. Um, so we're gonna move on. Thank you very much, Casey. We are gonna move on to Teresa. Mm -hmm. um, Hello, thank you for joining us from New York. Um, I want to ask you um, about your work that involves the, the, the female body, um, specifically your work, which I don't think that we see in the film, um, but you do make a series of neon breasts and they explore all the different um, experiences and journeys um, the, of the female form. Traditionally, breasts in neon have not been made by women. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about that work, um, what it's about and what it means to you and what you're hoping to relay to people who view it? Uh, sure, hi, hi everyone. I'm so happy to be here next to all these amazing artists. Um, I'm in New York right now. Yeah, that's true. Um, and well, so my vision with the breasts, the neon breasts, is from a personal experience I had with my own. So it all started from there, from my own personal experience. Um, the reason I started making uh, neon boobs is just to represent and celebrate the diversity from all the women, you know, um, size, uh, shape, color, and yeah, that was my original vision, just to express myself with with that and to celebrate and represent every woman. Um, yeah, um, that's all I have to say <laughs> with that. <laughs> yeah, in the film you, you mentioned kind of reflecting the work reflecting on you or you reflecting on the work and kind of the, the state that you get into when you're making neon and how important that is to you. And it, it really brings to mind the kind of meditative and spiritual practice of neon and how important the studio practice is to the art making. And I'd love for you to elaborate on that state and how that connects you to Neon. Uh, yeah, so in order for me to go to the studio and start making Neon and start working on my vision, I, I feel like I need to be in a certain state um, so I can create it, right? Uh, so I have two parts on my practice. Um, is when I'm starting to getting all these pieces together from my personal experience again. 
like how my how am I mentally in whatever situation, right? Uh, so my creative process starts with with that, with my own experience. So based on that, I get my own inspiration to start making my patterns and my designs. And that's one and that's one part. And the other part is for me, I need to be good with myself so I can go to the studio and start creating. Because if I don't feel good, I I just cannot have one piece done. I can have many, but nothing put together. Um, so that's the second part. And then there's a third part, depending on the piece, is where am I where I'm about to light it up, you know? For example, with the roses and with other pieces that I love bringing to the beach is where, um, well, is where I finally kind of put all together and then I, you know, um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. I kind of feel like I'm going noticing that too, though. one thing to another from another process. <laughs> so, uh, I went to the boobs, to the roses, to the beach, to my... <laughs> um, yeah, so I have all these process. My favorite part is when I bring my pieces to the beach, which you, you're able to see in the video when I took that rose. Uh, there's something about the beach. There's something about the water. I'm so feel so connected to it, and just the fact that I can see that vision I had in my head right there in the water, listening, you know, the waves and maybe the birds and the fog and maybe a little bit of rain sometimes and maybe a beautiful sunset. That's when everything comes together, and yeah, so. It's quite that's, beautiful. <laughs> that's me. And you so rarely see me on in that context, which is makes it so much more special. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, I, I, I could go deeper. I just tend to go from one thing to another like I just did, but <laughs> happy to answer all the questions you have. <laughs> um, thank you, Teresa. And we're gonna introduce another New York artist, Sarah Blood. Um, who is also a educator like Casey. Um, and like we were talking about earlier, this quality of neon, and you, all, you mentioned in the film, it's normally the brightest thing in the room. Um, and you deal with that head on in your work. Um, and I'd love for you to talk about how you kind of conceptualize these material conversations. Mm, yeah. Um... Yeah, I am really interested in uh, knocking the neonness away from the neon. Uh, and again, it's kind of like, um, it's trying to take a step away from the commercial um, baggage that neon has when we come to art making. So yeah, I, I've, I've been experimenting with gluing things to the surface of the neon, obscuring the front. Um, I've covered it in crochet cast in concrete, baked in cakes. Um, yeah, most, most recently I've covered it in glitter. Uh, just, just trying to kind of um, create a more even conversation between the neon and the other material because the neon can't, like it dominates everything. It's the loudest thing in the room. And so um, trying to get a more measured relationship between the materials is really kind of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um, you are a teacher at Alfred University. You teach many students year after year how to, how to bend neon and, and conceptualize uh, neon into their work. Can you tell us a little bit about how, or if, teaching influences your work, your own practice? Yes, so teaching does influence my work. I'm always learning more. I learn more and I learn quicker when I'm teaching than when I'm just like, uh, left to my own devices within my studio and that's because I'm having I have more people more brains with more ideas that are bringing things to the table and we're kind of constantly discussing constantly 
critiquing, evaluating, looking at art, um, exploring ideas. Um, and so it's, it's impossible not to be both energized and exhausted by that. But um, I'm always, uh, I've learned about three new artists in Neon um, just today because students have come to me saying, hey, I've seen this person. I want to do a presentation about their work. And I'm like, this is great. This is great. So, so yeah, it influences me in as much as it keeps me current um, in what's going on um, and keeps me kind of well fed with regards to mental stimulation. Um, yeah, even, even if I find making the physical act of making work uh, a little bit difficult during semester time, um, yeah, I, I, it's definitely something that feeds me, whether it's, and it's not necessarily directly, it's more indirectly, I think. You have to put a lot of your personal practice on hold during the semester when you're teaching, right? Yeah, I mean, I can, if I have something that's already conceived, I can make it. So I can produce during the semester time. I just don't have the mental capacity for thinking about my own practice, uh, which probably sounds a little bit weird, but um, there is so much, and Casey can speak to this as well, but we, there's so much creative energy that goes out. Yeah. Um, and we do it because we love it. But there's, you know, there's the same with everything. It's like there's a balance and there's a cost. And and so yeah, it's we thank you for all the wonderful new neon artists that you put out into the world and ensure that this craft stays alive. And same with you, Casey. <laughs> same with you, Casey. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are gonna kick it off to yet and I feel like we're the only non-New Yorkers here. Well. Native, New, Native New Yorker, but we live in San Francisco. <laughs> Everybody else is is joining us from New York, except for Casey, but you're normally in New York. Anyways, Kate, Kate Hush, the lovely Kate Hush. Um, you talk in the film, and I've heard the story in the past. I, I love your intro to the neon world and what inspired you um, to, to get into neon from Hitchcock's Vertigo. Can you talk a little bit about what you feel is the importance of that scene with Kim Novak and the green neon light and what character you feel uh, light or neon plays in film? I think the great thing about Hitchcock was he, he transitioned from black and white to color. So, he knew color was so important. And there is a thread throughout Vertigo where he uses green to identify with Kim Novak. And something I actually learned recently was it, that movie when it first came out wasn't received by audiences very well. So he took the Technicolor reel from the studio and locked it in a vault for years and years and years. And the only copies they had were degrading in color. So when they finally got their hands on one that they wanted to restore is when, I don't know if it was like 30 years later is when you finally saw they got it out of the vault and they're restoring the color and all the other ones and you finally saw what it was meant to be. And I believe that's what I saw. And he uses green throughout the film and it's this scene with Kim Novak where I don't want to give too much away, watch it if you haven't seen it, but it's this pivotal reveal. And Kim Novak is standing in a shadow and she comes out, but there's this bright green neon light. They're in a hotel room right outside the window. And you get, you see like, you can kind of peek at the corners of the lettering and it's just giving this ghostly gl green glow into the entire hotel room except the one corner she's in and then she kind of saunters out into the middle of the room and she's it was right after this large physical transformation but there was just something about the way the green neon just hit her and you kind of realize like her and the neon are a character all in one in that scene and then you just it hits you just how powerful color is especially the way neon cast color and I was in love ever since. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. You're, you're a big deal on Tumblr, I think. Right. Uh, all of your <laughs> um, you, you know, you, you've done a lot of graphics and animation, um, il illustrative work um, that is, that invokes the spirit of neon before you got into neon. Um, what was the question? Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, oh, how did that, how did that open the door for your neon work or how did that sort of play a role in, in any future work of yours? And how does it influence your work now? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it definitely influenced me to start playing with animation in actual neon because it, it wasn't something I really tried to tackle until I got deep into posting stuff on Tumblr. And it, you know, it helps you sit down and realize the possibilities of what you can do without actually bending the glass first. And, you know, the stuff on Tumblr got a lot of exposure and it opened up a lot of doors for me where I could bring this neon work. You didn't really see a lot to a broader audience and even like an advertorial campaign where it wasn't just, you know, a photograph of a, an actor or a model with just neon lettering. Like they let me draw the actual character as neon. And that would have never happened if my Tumblr didn't blow up. Sorry, we have an air compressor at my studio just doing its <laughs> thing right now. But uh, Casey? Yeah. <laughs> um, Similarly to uh, Teresa, you depict women in neon in a way that they haven't been before. Um, and you really toy with how women are depicted. Um, and I'm interested to learn about your philosophy around why you portray women the way that you do. Um, I think when you're talking about the actual, like, physical way I bend the glass and make the drawings. A lot of what I had seen was when you see women in neon, it was either those big women in Vegas or basically it was usually when you saw a woman that was bent in neon, it was for a strip club. And it wasn't done very anatomically well. And I would look at these depictions of the women and think, man, they look like creature from the black lagoon and I and I had been thinking about it and I was really new to bending and it took a while to figure out a way to do it and I really wanted to make them look graceful as opposed to cartoonish and it really came down to you have to pick and choose the detail you want to keep and I think my signature style is really I love keeping the eyes and the lips and then I just omit the nose because when you try to cram all that into a small face and neon, it's the tubes are like thick lines and it just starts looking blobby if you try to fit it all. But if you take that right thing away, it can be even more powerful. And I feel like the lips even are probably the most emotive part of my pieces. Kate, I have one last question for you. Um, you, you talked a little bit in the question, in the film about patterns and how when you first learned neon you like brought a pattern and you didn't even realize what that was can you describe can you tell us what a pattern is and the importance of the pattern to the process of neon for the audience who might not know so the pattern is basically the line drawing that you base your neon work off of and the way i like to explain how it works to people that have never seen neon being bent Say you have a piece of paper and you have your line drawing on it and it's pretty thick lines, the same thickness as the tubes of glass you're using. So you lay that down on a table and imagine you have a drinking straw, but it's made out of glass. You hold that drinking straw over a flame and heat it up. And then that pattern is on your table and you pick it up when the glass is soft and you lay it down on top of your drawing and you basically trace the drawing in the glass. And it's, I, I think it's one of the most fundamental parts of neon. I think without a great pattern, you're never gonna have a great piece. Very true. Right. And even with quote, two dimensional pieces of neon, like text that goes on a wall, the pattern, you're still bending in 3D, right? 
Yeah. So yeah, you- every single piece you see has a pattern. It started as a flat two-dimensional line drawing. Um, I wish you could get more into exactly how neon is made and have all of these amazing women and artists show you how it is actually made. Um, but we're going to take some audience questions because they're so great and we want to answer them. Um, the first one is what barriers do you think there are that limit, uh, limit people from understanding neon as an art form? And I think that that's a great question for both Casey and Jess. So Jess, you can start. Um, the barrier, uh, well, I think neon is hard to learn because of location. Not everywhere has a neon studio where you can go in and learn. Um, so I think that that can prevent somebody from learning. Um, but also money sometimes, glass is a lot of money, it's costly. And it takes a lot of money to rent out a studio or to even learn from a, from a neon artist or a teacher. But you can definitely find people that are willing to apprentice you. And that's basically how a lot of people do learn. You do start out underneath somebody that's willing to teach you the trade. Um, but despite all of those things that could prevent you from doing it, it's not impossible. And there are people out there that do help you. And there are locations where you can reach out and learn how to bend. Yeah. And Casey, what do you think the barrier is about people understanding it as high art? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that is. I get it. Why doesn't everybody else get it? Um, (laughs) (laughs) like there's a, there's, a lot going on in there and I think when you when you make it yourself you make work differently like you would design differently based on having the experience in the fire um and I always think that that is a really important turn to take Mm -hmm. Um, as far as like first second third class you know it's like the first thing I do is I'm like hi let's get your glasses and your blow hose and let's get in the fire. We're gonna do this first so you build this experience. And everyone's like, I wanna show you my drawings. I'm like, no, I don't wanna see your drawings till week two. You know, just keep those, you you keep them, you look at them later, you know, but like, we gotta feel this <laughs> first for a while. Um, and yeah, I would totally piggyback on what um, Jess said about access. There's just not a lot of places. You know, there's very few neon schools across the country. Um, even uh, higher education, right? There's Sarah, uh, me, Greg, I teach with Greg. Um, there's like three other people that I know of <laughs> at three other schools. Um, so just to kind of expand on that, I think um, is a good, a good place to start. Um, and I would say that um, as kind of an outsider to me honest in this context um that one of the biggest barriers is that people see neon is pretty ubiquitous especially in in an urban area um but it's often anonymous we see it at our local corner store we see it on the side of a building but we don't know how it's bent um a lot of the context that we see neon in is advertising historically that's true too Um, And on the part of art institutions, there is a resistance to portraying glass art and therefore neon as high art. Due to Chicago in the last uh, Virtual Wednesdays, which I mentioned, um, talks about her challenges working in glass. Um, And she says, you know, I went to my dealer and he said, I don't do glass. And so I think that it's kind of, um, neon is getting it from all angles that the public um, see it typically as a as an advertising form, as commercial form. Now we're seeing it more in interior design as well. Um, and so it's not acknowledged as a, as a fine art form. Um, and historically it hasn't been included in institutions as much. Um, so I think it's work on all of our parts. And that's a lot of what she Benz tries to do is to educate not only the public about how it's made and these amazing craftspeople who make it, um, but that there's such rich uh, conceptual work and history in in neon. Um, And we're running a little bit out of time, but there's one more great question, which is if there's one thing people could know about neon, what would it be? One thing, only one thing. Can we each say one thing? I think we can. 
For me, it's that every single piece of neon you see is made by hand. The Bud Light sign, everything. Um, each bend is made individually by humans' hands and their breath. Um, and that I think is incredible. Um, I guess for me, if I wanted, if I wanted people to know one thing, it's that um, most of the neon art that you see out in the world is not made by the artists themselves. <laughs> Who wants to go next? <laughs> um, well, I want to say that the re one of the reasons I love neon is the fact that we have we are able to put gas in a tiny tube and make light out of it. And I just find that so fascinating, like uh, gas that you can see, but it's out there. We somehow we get it, we take it, we put it in a tube, like <laughs> depending the diameter, it doesn't matter. And then boom, we bend the shape and make light out of it or with it so that's really fascinating it's something that is out there taken mm -hmm. in boom yeah. like i love that jess what's your one thing um neon is not toxic i think that that's something that we should all know it is not toxic i know the led companies love to say it is but every gas that Teresa was referring to that we use is inside of our atmosphere and it's taken out of the atmosphere by cryogenic distillation. And we breathe in all these gases every day. And the only toxicity to it is maybe the minuscule amount of mercury, but like- In some uh, tubes, not even in all tubes, only in some tubes. Not in all of them. So that's the thing I would like to put out into the world. It is not a toxic material. And with that very renewable, neon very glass and noble gas. If it breaks, you rebend the glass. No plastic. <laughs> What's your one thing? <laughs> I, my one thing was the same as Jess is actually, but without the fancy like word of the dis, uh, removing of the gases. <laughs> Casey, I know you're almost asleep, but give <laughs> us, give us one thing that you want somebody, anybody, the audience, people in the world to know about neon. If there was one thing um it's a set of skills you can't use for anything else um <laughs> and you can't uh you can't practice it unless you're doing it and it's really fun so there's three okay perfect all right Kate, last but not least finish this off <laughs> um neon is expensive and has a high price point but on the flip side of that i really want people to know it is a lifelong investment it is not like a light bulb you go and buy at CVS. You can have a piece made and it can outlive you as long as you're careful with it and you take care of it. Don't, don't try to deinstall it yourself. It's a, it's a great, beautiful investment. All right, we have one more question to close with. Um, somebody asked what aspects of the art are most exciting and most concerning today and I will just echo what everybody said about how exciting it is, right? The fact that gases are in the atmosphere and we're doing something so unique by hand. It's perfectly unchanged after more than a hundred years. Um, it's nostalgic and also futuristic at the same time. And what's most concerning about it is that so few people know how it's done and it, it, it might, you know, we're, it's at risk almost all the time, right? That's what's most concerning. So we at SheBends and Jess with her film and all the amazing educators and artists here today, um, our core mission is to try and foster the future of this trade and to educate people and let them know what it's all about so that we can keep it going. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, artists. Thank you, the Dion. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much to all the artists over at SheBends. And thank you for such an insightful conversation. This program was brought to you in support of the exhibition, Judy Chicago, A Retrospective, now on view at the DeYoung Museum. Please check out our website for more information and please book your tickets in advance, tickets.famsf.org. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and we hope to see you next week.